Hi, everybody. Just a really quick update before we get into the show. Uh, normally, I give myself a little more time for editing, but this week, uh, for this episode, that wasn't really possible. So this episode might be a little less polished than normal, but hopefully, uh, you know, you won't notice too much of a difference. But believe it or not, it actually does take me uh, a few hours to edit the episodes that actually get released. As much as we sound like a little bit of a rambly mess, uh, it does actually take some work to uh, make it much more listenable. Uh, cutting out just, you know, longer gaps or breaths or things like that that sound weird. So um, not as much time for this episode for those kinds of things. So uh, hopefully you can still enjoy it. But I think it's a good one, if not uh, a little bit long. But uh, hopefully you enjoy it too. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 126 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That is Gavin. That is Fia. And how are you guys doing today? Doing good. I'm pretty good. Yeah. 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 Uh, just had a little, uh, right before we started recording, a little uh, house vent session with Mike. He asked about the house. And, uh, and yeah, I, uh, I let him know about the house. <laughs> it's going. Okay. Yeah. yeah, buying a house right now is probably not the it's smartest financial decision. Um, but it was, it was the, the right move for us. Um, you know. But anyway... We can talk about that in uh, maybe a bonus episode eventually sometime. <laughs> Probably not. Yes, a Patreon exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> if and when we ever actually make a Patreon, which uh, I don't think we actually have any realistic plans to. So, um, yeah, it's a that's a mm-hmm. complicated tax situation that I don't want to deal with. So. Yep. Anyway, how, how are you doing, Fia, down in uh, the warm weather? Um, good. It's just, for me, now my standards are higher, and so I am cold <laughs> in this 50-degree weather. Wait, so what Jeez. What part of Florida are you in? Are you in Tallahassee? Is that where nope. University of I, Florida is? I am in Gainesville, oh, Okay. which, if you... It is... Technically considered North Central. Okay. Florida. So how far are you from Georgia? Like the edge of Florida? Or the edge of Georgia? Yeah. Maybe like two to three hours. Okay. Maybe three hours. I don't know. Let me look. <laughs> Yeah, because it's, you know, north central. I guess, how far north are you of, like, Orlando? Oh, uh... I'm not very good with miles, but... Uh, (laughs) You know, hours works, too. Yeah, depending on traffic, uh, an hour and a half to three hours. Okay. Okay. All right. Because Orlando's crazy. <laughs> yeah. How do we wind up here? I don't know. I asked how Florida was. It's cold here, and people hey, boo, are like... Boo, I, I swear. I swear if you say that one more time, Fia. It's just You're like... You're saying that to a, to a Syracusean and my a borderline Canadian. still get to be valid, even though yours are also valid. <laughs> absolutely not. I re- I absolutely reject that when it comes to temperatures from people from Florida. Okay. To be well, fair, I don't think Fia would say she's from Florida. Yeah, I'm not from <laughs> here. I just go. All right, here. fine. You have a point on my grammar. Doesn't so even go here. Sorry. <laughs> it's been a weird few days in the in the Davidson household here. Um, All right, guys. But anyway. <laughs> Don't forget to rate the show. Yeah, Yeah, hit us with some housekeeping. But like, like wait a couple minutes and then rate the show. Don't do it right now. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. Give us feedback, please. And uh, if you would like to be a guest or would like to hear about any specific topics, just go to the forms all in the show notes. And uh, that was not a very good housekeeping but what's next episode topic hey you know we got there in the end that's all we that got matters. there um 
this episode, we're going to be talking about lots of different groups of critters that eat plants, mostly mammals. Uh, but what we're not going to talk about is what eating plants actually means. Because we're going to talk, we're going to talk about that in next episode. We're going to be talking about just the topic of herbivory, what nice. it means for animals to eat food that is not other animals. Um, because it's way more complicated than you think. Uh, and we're not going to really talk about it all that much in this episode, but it is really complicated in ways uh, that we kind of take for granted as an animal that can eat both meat and plants. Uh, that's very that's a very complicated thing to do chemically in your body. Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about next episode. Um, so yeah, look forward to that. Speaking of next episode... Um, it might be a little different. We actually just had a conversation about this, too. Uh, we normally record on Mondays, and the next time we would record would be Christmas, which we're not going to do. Uh, so hopefully you won't notice anything, and there will be an episode out on the 27th. Um, but if there is a little wonky with that episode, uh, you know, it's the holidays. We all, we all deserve a break. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, awesome. Thanks for the, the uh, housekeeping, Fia. Uh, Mike, what happened today? Um, so today, in the year two thousand, um, Al Gore delivered his uh, his like final um, concession speech. Um, this was after uh, Bush v. Gore basically ended all the recounts in Florida in the year two thousand, and that basically you know put to bed um, all of the um, um, all the legal wrangling back and forth over the two thousand election. If anybody ever wants to learn more about that, there's a great movie called Recount. Um, just like, basically, it's everything from Election Day until, you know, Al Gore gives that speech um, about all the back and forth and how crazy the 2000 election was after the election took place. Um, so, yeah, what is that? Uh, 13 years ago today, Al Gore um, officially gives up. Ooh, yep. <laughs> that's a really uh, yep. long time. Yeah, and also, I guess I didn't think about because, like, election day is, is what it's the first Tuesday after the first Monday, right? Isn't that what it is? Correct, correct. So, anytime between November second and November eighth, whatever the Tuesday happens to be. Um, yeah. So, and it was December thirteenth. Okay, so a little over a month. Huh. Yep. For whatever reason, that is a shorter time than I had thought, which, like, just based on the timeline makes sense, because Inauguration Day is always the January 20th. Right. So, like, that makes sense in my brain, but that also seems like too short of a time. It is still incredibly quick quick to have all those cases, a case go to the Supreme Court for, like, it is, like, on one hand, like, good it moved that quick, but... Knowing what we know about American politics, the fact that yeah. uh, the fact that something you know moved with the appropriate speed that it should have is kind of incredible. And also, just the the thinking of all the the ways the world would be different if George W. Bush had not been president. George W. Bush in the, in the early two thousands, we wouldn't have had all those awesome quotes from George W. Bush. Yeah, when you he know, was president, that's you're right. That's true. I mean, that's all I got. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for that, Mike. That's making me think about Al Gore, and, and that makes me think about South Park. And before we get into more of that... Oh, jeez. Fia, what okay. is going on down in the Seagrass Corner? Yeah, welcome back to Seagrass Corner. We took a break last episode, but we're back. So, I talked to you guys about, so far, two different kinds of seagrasses, and related them to noodles. The first one was turtle grass, which is like the fettuccine of marine grass. Love because it. it, yeah. It, and then we have manatee grass, which is like the spaghetti of seagrass. And now... Add some of that for dinner. Yum. Love that. I have ravioli, but I don't know what type what of seagrass sea that would be. That? <laughs> we might, that might be a macroalgae. <laughs> we might... We might, okay, all right. that might go somewhere else. But this next seagrass is going to be shoal grass or Haliduli righty or righty eye, depending on how you like to pronounce it. Um, shoal grass will be the equivalent of angel hair because 
it is very very thin and fine and uh people often know your like feeling the shoal grass as basically as thin as hair it feels very thin and and flat and it's short um these saltwater grasses grow around 20 centimeters tall so that's not really that tall for seagrass no that's what four four or five inches maybe six inches somewhere yeah. in that ballpark mm -hmm. i'd say it's about average yeah. height but you know jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so these are found in coastal uh, waters off the coast of many Caribbean islands and also along the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. And um, yeah, these species are considered more of a pioneer species in terms of seagrass, seagrass succession. So when you're thinking about a seagrass bed being first form, formed, this is usually one of the first um, species that will start growing um, and start like rooting and growing um, into like a bed because they're fast growing and they can um, kind of propagate very quickly. And then eventually they stabilize the sediment and get um, make it more favorable for some of the longer term sea grasses like the turtle grass to come in and dominate those seagrass beds and then that's how you get those luscious thick meadows of seagrass. Um, oh, so they're like the, the like the mosses or ferns of seagrass. Yes. Yeah, like after like a, a fire comes through or some other oh, big yeah. ecosystem okay, yeah, yeah, disruption. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh or I guess in the terms of like uh, an ocean like a right. big uh, like hurricane or something that churns up all the soil. And yeah. uh, they're the first ones to sort of pave the way for everything else. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. And cool. uh, yeah, that's the shoal grass or the angel hair pasta. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. So with the, our wonderful intro segments out of the way, let's get into the main topic of the episode. The Pleistocene Epic, or, uh, Pleistocene, or did I say Pleistocene? Oops. The Paleocene Epic, or sometimes you might hear it, Paleocene Epoch. Uh, it is spelled E-P-O-C-H. I've heard it both ways, and I don't still to this day know which one is correct. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say Epic because it sounds cool. Uh, it makes it sound like it's Epic. Epic. Um, but either or is technically correct. So... The Paleocene is from 66.0 million years ago to 56.0 million years ago. Basically, the 10 million years right after the end Cretaceous, ma Cretaceous mass extinction that, uh, you know, drove all of the non-bird dinosaurs to go extinct. So this is the direct aftermath of when the big asteroid hit the planet. And we've talked about... A lot of mass extinctions on this show before. Uh, you can find all of those, you know, in, in our playlist on our YouTube channel or just on our, our podcast page. But we've talked about all five of the big five mass extinctions. The end Ordovician mass extinction, the end or late Devonian, the end Permian, the end Triassic. And uh, the last time we did an episode in this sort of loose series we're doing going through all the geologic time periods, the end Cretaceous. And out of all of them, this is the end Cretaceous was by far the most recent, like by a lot. So the end Cretaceous mass extinction was 66 million years ago. The previous one was over 130 million years before that. Oh, wow. And so yeah. that is a lot of time for fossils and rocks to be lost. Whereas yeah. 66 million years ago, while still a long time ago, compared to a lot of the other mass extinctions, was basically yesterday. All of that means we have much better information about the aftermath of the extinction here than we do for any of the other ones. 
That's that's just sort of how the fossil record works. The more recent you get, the more good quality information you have. That makes sense. Yeah. So, what was the world like right after, you know, this giant asteroid hit the planet? Well, in the beginning of the of the epic, so I, sh- I should also clarify here real quick, I meant to do this more at the beginning. Um, the reason why we went from talking last episode in this sort of series about the Cretaceous period to now the Paleocene epic is that, as I mentioned, the more recent you get, the more information you have. And because of that, we're able to further divide time while still maintaining the resolution that you need to be able to talk about things with a good level of confidence. So the Paleocene epic is the beginning part of the Paleogene period. Hmm. The, the Paleogene, if, if you've, you know, paid attention to um, geology, you know, 20 years ago or so, which I don't think many people listen to the podcast have, um, but you'll often hear the Cretaceous mass extinction referred to as the KT mass extinction that at one point stood for Cretaceous tertiary which is what the period used to be called right after the extinction. Um, now it's called the KPG extinction, and PG is for Paleogene. Um, mm. A lot of different science reasons for why we decided to change the name collectively as a science, but it more or less comes down to we have more information, we are better able to break down these chunks of time into smaller sections while still having a lot of information to learn, uh, to learn from and to talk about. So... That is why we're talking about the Paleocene epic and not the larger Paleogene period. Cool. Yeah, so, anyway, uh, we'll talk about some of the abiotic features, things that the climate was doing, things that the continents and oceans were doing, uh, before we start talking about some of the cool critters running around at this time. So the climate, uh, at least at the beginning of the, the Paleocene, was a lot like the Cretaceous. Although it was very cold for the first few years uh, to about a decade after the asteroid hit. Uh, because as you can imagine, uh, when a rock several miles wide <laughs> hits the Earth, that kicks up a lot of dust. And that mm. blocked out the sun for, you know, a few years to a decade, based on all the information we have. Wow. And so... During that time, it was real cold because there was no sunlight or very little sunlight reaching the actual surface of the planet. Um, And after that, the climate took a bit to recover um, and was a bit drier than it was during the Cretaceous period, but still much warmer and wetter than it is today. After the dust, you know, literal dust settled. Um, And, you know, throughout the period, it would sort of recover to this temperature and um, um, humidity, global humidity, that it had in the Cretaceous, uh, with global average temperatures about 20 degrees Fahrenheit higher than today. So this was a very warm time in Earth's history. Uh, Right now is also a very cold time in Earth's history, relatively speaking. Hmm. Um, And I I specify that it was global average temperature. because just as we talk about with climate change today, yeah, some places only are going to get, you know, a quarter of a degree warmer. But that's not the most important thing, you know? Some places are going to get much, much, much warmer. Uh, and that was the case back then, you know, at this time as well, because the poles were much warmer than they are today. In, you know, on the scale of, you know, 50, 60 degrees Fahrenheit warmer because there wasn't ice, or at least permanent ice at the poles. And that's where a lot of that 20 degrees average global temperature comes from. Um, Yeah, so with the poles being much warmer, tropical regions, equatorial regions, probably only being a few degrees warmer, maybe 10 degrees warmer than they are today. At the end of the, the, uh, the uh, epic, though, there was an event called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or P-E-T-M. I feel like we've heard about that before. We sure have. We had a whole episode about it, episode 32. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, We will talk about that more at the end of the episode, but as you might be able to tell from the words thermal maximum, uh, it got real hot. 
<laughs> How hot? Uh, stay tuned. So, uh, moving on to some of the other abiotic stuff. The continents were not quite where we see them today. Uh, sea levels were quite a lot higher than they are today because there wasn't any water locked up as glaciers and stuff. Um, so Europe was largely just a set of islands instead of sort of a solid continent like it is today. There was still continental rock underneath the oceans there, but most of Europe was covered by shallow oceans with an occasional island here or there. Uh, let's see. Uh, because of that, a lot of uh, the coastlines that we see on maps today will look very unfamiliar if you look at sort of a paleo projection of a map from around this time. Um, a lot of the features we still see from the Cretaceous are still kind of present, so there was still... Uh, a large body of water in sort of the center of North America, at least at the beginning, um, called the Western Interior Seaway. It's a very famous uh, section of, um, you know, rocks that it left behind. Very famous for uh, leaving really good fossils of mosasaurs and plesiosaurs uh, until the extinction when all of those went extinct. And so during this time, the Western Interior Seaway... There's not a ton of rocks left from it because it was very much receding by this point just due to like continental uplift and different shifting around of the continents um, causing that water to recede. But um, the continents were slowly moving to where we see them today, but coastline-wise and stuff look very different. Uh, particularly in the southern hemisphere because North America and Asia were close enough to be sort of connected by an occasional land bridge, but broadly kind of on their own. Um, Africa had just sort of left uh, the rest of the southern continents, so Africa was kind of on its own. India was, you know, well on its way to forming the Himalayas and had basically just collided with the rest of Asia at this point. And uh, the rest of the southern continents, so South America, Antarctica, and Australia were still connected uh, and moving their way uh, south for uh, Antarctica to eventually... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Sophia, if you have any comments as, you know, the actual marine biologist here, please chime in. Okay, will do. Um, today, ocean currents are driven by a really, really complex mix, mostly of two things, though. Uh, lots of other factors, but it's mostly two things. That's temperature and salinity, because the salinity changes the density of the water, and so does temperature. Um, so generally, when the ocean currents get to the poles... The water gets colder and it sinks. And uh, when the currents move toward the equator and the tropical regions, it gets warmer and rises, generally. Um, and also a, a similar kind of thing with salinity, where fresher water is less dense than saltier water. So the saltier water is what sinks. And different salt water versus fresh water inputs into the ocean also influence the currents as well. However, right. okay, cool. Ocean currents are very complicated. And I don't yeah. understand them particularly well. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, even sci as well as we, you know, try to make models of modeling ocean currents and what's going to happen to them with future global warming. Um, a lot of that is also really poorly understood just because it is such an incredibly complex system. Right. Way back in the Paleocene, though, um, temperature gradients across the planet were much, much weaker than they are today. So they didn't have uh, that temperature input because they didn't have ice at the poles to cool down the water to cause it to sink to drive those currents. So at this time, ocean currents were driven almost entirely by salinity, which makes them really funky because... It really depends on where that freshwater input is coming from. That's the main driver of uh, the currents is where major rivers would be emptying out into the ocean. 
And because of that, because there's less of a driving force, the oceans were a lot more stagnant. There was not nearly as much ocean circulation as there is today, which is part of why we see the oceans as, you know, bursting with life as we have them. Because all of that, those ocean currents, because they're so strong today, move around sediments and nutrients from one part of the globe to another. And that's why the oceans are, you know, productive today. That's not to say they weren't productive back then, but to a much lesser degree. And it caused a lot of uh, sort of isolation of productive parts of the ocean and less productive parts of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, on top of that, with global temperatures being much higher, ocean temperatures also were much higher. The average deep water temperature today is basically just above freezing. You know, maybe two to three degrees Celsius. Back then, deep water, so this was bottom of the ocean, was around 10 degrees Celsius, around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Hmm. And this is about the surface temperature of the water around the UK today. That was sort of the closest ballpark I could find. And, which is not warm by any means. The UK is not known for being a particularly warm place. Um, but, you know, people swim the English Channel for sport. Yeah. So, warm enough to do sporting in. Um, and that is the coldest waters on the bottom of the ocean were that warm. Uh, spoilers. We'll talk much more about how warm the bottom of the ocean is uh, in a little bit. Uh, and lastly, you talked about temperature stuff, uh, at least for now. Uh, with global temperatures so high, if you understand anything about climate science, you probably guessed that CO2 levels were also quite high. Uh, mm-hmm. This varies kind of from source to source, depending on, on you know, which paper you read or, or uh, you know, where you're getting your data from. But the, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere sort of ranges to only a little bit higher than today uh, to over double today's CO2 concentrations. Um, the general consensus seems to be somewhere a bit above 600 parts per million, which is about 50%, uh, higher than it is today. Jeez. So wait, uh, there's, yeah, there's an estimation of it being similar to today. There are some, and it is kind of hard to find, um, just, you know, through my typical sources that I use for research for this podcast, uh, good data, because anytime you Google, you know, or even like Google Scholar or whatever, yeah. however else you, you search for, you know, papers and things, um, whenever you search uh, Paleocene carbon dioxide or like atmospheric carbon dioxide levels, you just get absolutely flooded with information about the PETM, so the, the very end part, mm-hmm. not much about the rest of the time. Um, Gotcha. So, I'm sure that those data do exist. I wasn't able to find a good source for, I I think, just like the general range that I kept seeing, and I'm sure that this is just like uh, an error bar, because even though, like I said, this is a relatively recent time period, given all the stuff we talked about on the show, um, this is still over 50 million years ago, so there's still pretty big error bars on a lot of these things. Yeah. So that's probably what it means is that the air, the low end of the, you know, confidence okay. interval is like, you know, 450 parts per million compared yeah. to, you know, a bit like 420 ish that we are at today. Maybe mm-hmm. 440. I don't remember the most recent uh, measurements, but yeah, somewhere above 600 is generally the vibe that I, the, the you know, the number that I saw a lot. Cool. Cool. So that is a lot of the life, or a a lot of the non-life things going on on the planet. Let's talk about the actual life. Because uh, a big theme in Earth history, of at least the animals in Earth history, is that after an extinction, life likes to sort of experiment and try new things. And as I mentioned before, this is the best look that we have had so far at how life responds directly to a mass extinction. 
and like all the other big mass extinctions, life was hit very hard by the end Cretaceous extinction, um, which for anyone not familiar, uh, I'll give a brief recap of what exactly that was. Um, a bolide, which is a fancy term for a giant space rock, one that actually makes it to the surface, uh, hit... Uh, this rock was, I, I knew that I had it somewhere in here when I mentioned it before, but somewhere between six and nine miles wide. Oh. It's, it's a big rock. Mm-hmm. Uh, this rock hit Earth in what is now the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, and this caused about 75% of all species to go extinct, including very uh, common and very um, abundant and successful groups like ammonites, uh, Previously, we've called these swirly-shelled squid boys. <laughs> uh, pterosaurs, your flying reptiles. Uh, marine reptiles like plesiosaurs, mosasaurs, and of course, the non-avian dinosaurs. Uh, as well as many, many uh, species of groups that did not go totally extinct. So, uh, it's often sort of framed that mammals and birds sort of came through unscathed to take over the world. Uh, spoilers for the rest of this conversation. Uh, but mammals also saw quite a lot of extinction. Uh, you know, not the 100% that the non-avian dinosaurs did, but still, you know, a good 50% of species, including lots of groups that had been around for tens, you know, of, of millions of years. Uh, birds were also hit really hard, uh, and there are many groups of birds that were doing great in the Cretaceous that just don't make it. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, when we talk about what birds were doing uh, after the extinction. Mm -hmm. But long story short, in terms of how this matters to the aftermath, anything on land anyway, that weighed more than about 55 pounds went extinct. Ballpark. Uh, This is likely due to a shortage of food that, you know, you need a lot of food to have a big body. And when everything dies at once, there's just less food to go around. Um, And there were some exceptions, but they were almost entirely aquatic or semi-aquatic. Things like crocodilians and turtles, for example. Um, Crocodilians seem to do more or less fine across the extinction. Some extinctions here and there, but not nearly even what you see in mammals. Um, And similar thing with turtles, although they're a little harder to study. Uh... In the immediate aftermath, after all the dust had settled, there were lots of niches in in the world to fill. Uh, which, like I mentioned, usually leads to some funky stuff going on. The first two to three million years or so were relatively quiet. There wasn't much that got bigger than probably a medium dog or so. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, so just... Dog is a unit of measurement. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah, it's familiar to everybody, you know. Right. No, I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. Yeah. Uh, and so the main group of mammals in the meantime, so in this two to three million year interval, were this group called the multi-tuberculates. We've mentioned them here and there. They probably deserve their own episode because they were e- extraordinarily successful during, you know, most of the time that mammals have been around. Um, They're very well studied because they were basically around from the very beginning of mammals, and they make it through the end Cretaceous extinction and through the Paleocene, although uh, when we talk about the next epic, the Eocene, we will talk about them uh, in spoilers, how they don't make it. Um, But in this interval, they were doing great. These guys were, they're very rodent-like superficially, Um, and likely do a lot of the same things that rodents do today, uh, but are not closely related to any group of mammals today. They are sort of even outside, um, like platypus and echidnas, the ones that lay eggs. So we are more closely related to the ones that lay eggs than we are to these guys. So they're mammals, but they're very strange. Um, and these guys probably did great because they were small. They kind of could eat everything. They could eat all the insects. They could eat any seeds or nuts or things that they found around. So they were just very opportunistic, which is why they... Opportunistic species in general tend to do really well after extinctions because um, any of the specialists are gone. 
and the opportunist can just kind of do everything kind of well instead of doing one thing very well. And when the world is going to, to heck, uh, you want to be a, a bit of a jack-of-all-trades. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Yeah. And so the three currently living today branches of mammals being the monotremes, the ones that lay eggs, platypus and kittens, um, the marsupials, and the placentals were all present during this time and left nice fossils for us. Um, the other sort of smaller groups of mammals uh, would sort of pop up mostly toward the end of the epic, if at all. So, for example, the Afrotherians, these are things that originate from the continent of Africa. These are your elephants, your Serenians, your, you know, manatees and dugongs, uh, things like aardvarks as well. We see the very first Afrotherians show up around this time. Uh, the first Xenarthrins, which are native to South America. These are your armadillos and sloths and anteaters. The very first ones of them show up around this time in South America. Uh, primates, rodents, carnivorans, uh, they all appear confidently during the Paleocene. Some other groups uh, possibly have some members or at least direct ancestors in the Paleocene. Things like odd-toed ungulates, which are your horses and rhinos. Uh, the group that includes uh, moles, hedgehogs, and shrews might technically be here. Uh, but the other ones show up basically as soon as this uh, epic ends. But because we don't have our usual cast of characters that we see around today, there were lots of wacky mammals running around that we don't really understand what they're related to. <laughs> and uh, because this is an audio medium, they're a little hard to describe. Um, yeah. So for this part, I only imagine. Uh, I'm going to enlist the help of my wonderful co-hosts if you go to the doc, and I should have warned Mike about this earlier because I see he's not in the Google Doc. Um, no, I am not. It's going to take me a hot second to get there, but I'll get there. That's all right. I'll keep talking in the meantime. Um, yeah, so I've put links in our Google Doc here. I'm going to ask you guys to help me also describe what these things look like because... My brain works different sometimes, uh, and so when I describe something, oftentimes that is not how other people see it. Um, and so we're going to be talking about first some of the herbivorous ones running around, and then some of the carnivorous ones uh, running around a little bit uh, later, in just a second. Cool. So the first group we're going to be talking about are called taniodonts. Uh, these were sort of digging herbivores. They would dig up things like roots and tubers, like potatoes or carrots or things to eat. Um, some of these got quite large, sort of large dog to black bear sized. So in the, you know, 100 to like 250, 300 pound range. And they look like if a hyena was adopted by an anteater. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. It's like, I was going to say it kind of looks like a wolverine and like an otter mixed together. Ooh, otter's good. Yeah, I definitely see that. Um, a really strange thing about almost all of these groups is that they are uh, plantodont, or um, uh, plantigrade, which means they walk on all of their foot instead of like a cat or a dog where they just walk on their toes, or an ungulate, which walks on the very end of their toes. So seeing like an otter but that has its whole foot on the ground, or like a wolf that yeah. has its whole foot in the ground, just like kind of looks wrong. Yeah, like almost like a like a nightmare kind of creature. Yeah. And so uh, these guys had, you know, big claws, but these were, you know, mostly herbivorous um, that ate roots and tubers and things, but looking at their big claws and their big teeth, like you, you probably wouldn't guess that. Let's see. Uh, the next group are my personal... Actually, no, these aren't my favorite, but they are very silly looking. Um, <laughs> these are called the pantodonts. And they're often sort of depicted as rhino-like because they are sort of big and, and plodding. Um, and I sort of think they look like a droopier bear with like a longer tail and kind of a smaller head. They kind of have, like, a capybara kind of face. 
Yeah, I get that. But I don't even know what to say about these guys. Yeah, like I, said, I don't like. There's one in particular. Um, it's a, a if you go to like the Wikipedia page for Pantodonta, which is the the actual group. Um, one of them that you'll see is called Barry Lambda, which I don't know why it just kind of looks like a bear, but it does have like a very sort of boxy capybara head, um, like like yeah. you mentioned, Fia. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Some of these guys got quite big and were likely, you know, the largest animals in their ecosystems. And keep in mind, like I said, biggest animals potentially on the planet. Uh, and that's not like a crocodilian or like a really big fish or something. Um. And these guys got about eight feet long and about fifteen hundred pounds. So that's that's about as big as we get, at least in the earlier parts. Um, and these may or may not be somewhere closely related to ungulates. Kind of unsure. Like I said, a lot of these guys are weird. The next one, uh, this was the one that is my personal favorite from these ones we're talking about here, called the Dinoceratins, which means terrible horn, and. They are just kind of strange. Um, they kind of look like, kind of like a pig or a rhino, but instead of having like the one horn on the front, like a rhino has, they just have a bunch of like knobby, almost like giraffe horns, but like kind of all across their face. Yeah. Yep. This is a. It's a weird rhino. This is a rhino that got left in too long. Yeah, <laughs> and if if you so the the link that I posted is just the Google Images search, just because that's the easiest thing. <laughs> Uh, to do, but it's very deceptive because there's one on here that is definitely not in this group. One of like the first ten is definitely not it. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know that's Google for you, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, so these guys they also had like short tusks, um, sort of like a like a pig's tusks as well. Um, these guys may have been, again, somewhere around ungulates and the, the very earliest ungulate ancestors. And these guys could also get quite big as well, um, but they would get much larger in the Eocene. But these guys were, were around toward the end of the Paleocene. So that's the uh, herbivorous ones. So some of the carnivorous ones, uh, the first ones uh, is a group called the Mesonychia. And... These guys are just, like, very strange-looking for carnivores. They look kind of like a wolf, but with, like, a very low-slung, long, bulkier head. And also hooves, because uh, they're also related to ungulates. A lot of these pictures of these animals look like they're just, like, pieces of other animals photoshopped together with other yeah. pieces of animals. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's <laughs> honestly, yeah. Um, and again, these guys could be potentially bear sized. These guys got quite large, uh, and were, you know, some of the main predators in their environments. Uh, the next group is a group that at least looks a little more familiar. Uh, these are called creodonts. These are sort of just outside of our carnivorans. So we have all of the carnivorous mammals today. So that would be your dogs, your cats, um, bears, raccoons, seals, and such. So all of them are together, and then sort of just outside that are the creodonts. And these had a really wide range of shapes and, and sizes, but ranged from wolf-like to, like, a very large weasel with that kind of very long but low-slung body. But they could get that shape up to the size of, like, a lion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't look that weird. You know these these would look not out of place today. They have a very long tail. Yeah, and the last, at least, group of mammals that we're going to be talking about here is uh, a group that is not an actual group, but you'll often see it when you look up stuff about the Paleocene or the Eocene. There's a group called the Condylarths, or Condylarths, and uh, this is very famously what is known as a wastebasket taxon, meaning we don't really know what this is, so we're going to put it all together, because they share like one or two things in common. Uh, and in this case, it is 
small, relatively nondescript things with hooves. Hmm. Um, so this is not an actual group. Um, this is just all the stuff that we didn't know where else to put and still kind of haven't figured out where else to put. And even though I say things with hooves, they still have, like, toes and stuff. They just have, like, a little hoof cap at the end of each of their toes, which is a little unusual for what we think of hooved animals today. Yeah. Um, but these were sort of all the other, you know, lesser background sort of things. The miscellaneous group. Yeah, more or less. Cool. Cool. And that, so that that's kind of it for mammals. Again, just all the weird stuff, but with the, the very beginnings of cropping up of, like I said, things like primates, rodents, the very earliest carnivorans, nowhere close to, you know, the cats and dogs that we have today, but they're very distant ancestors. Um, so that should be the last thing that you y- all should have to look up uh, for today. So thank yeah. you. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sadly, moving away from the mammals for a bit, uh, moving on to birds. Uh, birds are the other group really well known for doing lots of cool stuff after the dinosaurs go extinct. Uh, throughout this epic, we see the first members of quite a few groups of modern birds. Uh, pretty much all of them, actually. Uh, including things like penguins, so even like really specialized groups start to show up here. Uh, we, yeah, I even looked it up because I was like, there's no way we have hummingbirds from this time because they're so small. I'm like, even if they were around, there's no way we have fossils of them, right? But no, we actually do, apparently. Uh, apparently, the only lineage that doesn't really show up in the Paleocene are the relatives of uh, chicken and turkeys and hmm. ducks and geese and swans. So, like, the sort of fowl uh, group of birds. But pretty much everything else crops up really, really shortly afterwards. Some of them were around a little bit before. So, like, the split between um, all of the other birds and the ratites. We had a whole episode of, episode about them, the larger flightless birds. Uh, that split happened probably sometime before this in the Cretaceous or like immediately after the asteroid hit. Um, so we didn't have any of the ratites being their giant full size yet, but we did have some giant flightless birds. Not quite, like I said, the ratites, but a different group, sort of um, like the great, great uncle Of, like, ducks and geese and stuff. And uh, that is uh, a genus called Gastornis, which for a long time, when when people saw Gastornis, they just kind of assumed that it was predatory because it it superficially looked a lot like terror birds, which is a group of giant flightless birds that we've talked about before, native to South America. They weren't really around yet at this time, but this particular bird looked a lot like them. And uh, if you watched... uh, I believe, Walking with Prehistoric Beasts growing up, like I did. That was sort of the mammal equivalent to Walking with Dinosaurs. It's like a BBC, I think, produced documentary from the early 2000s. It actually showed this uh, as predatory, because that's what we thought at the time. But it turns out, nope, it's just a giant uh, fruit eater. Fruit and nuts and stuff, which is why it had such a big head to be able to chomp down on seeds and things. But yeah, Gastornis uh, was just a, a giant, you know, six or so foot tall flightless bird that was sort of the main large herbivore on all those islands that made up Europe at the time. Uh, the large mammals, because it was islands, didn't, you know, hadn't quite gotten to Europe yet. So this is what was filling that large uh, herbivore niche at the time. Um, another quick side note to... Um, uh, Gastornis, uh, another group of birds that is neat but not around today uh, that show up here, especially toward the end, is a group called the Pelagornithids, which are birds that looked and, and sort of lived very superficially like an albatross. So sort of flying across the world over the oceans from you know place to place. Uh, these got very large later, but at this time we're still pretty moderately sized in, uh, you know, during the Paleocene. They're the size of maybe like a small pelican, which is still a, a, a fairly large bird. Um, yeah. But what's really interesting about these guys, though, is that even though all birds today, as well as all the birds at this time, lacked true teeth, this group evolved spikes on their beak to function as teeth. Huh? 
Yeah, so teeth, you know, being a, a structure that, you know, can fall out and is made out of, uh, you know, dentin and enamel, uh, that was not these. Bird had, birds had lost teeth by this time fully. Uh, during the Cretaceous, there were still some birds that had, you know, true actual teeth, but all of those went extinct. This group of birds, because they mostly ate fish, uh, evolved just spikes of bone on their beaks that functioned as teeth. Uh, because they did not have actual teeth. Wow. Yeah. Um, this was a very successful group of birds. They made it pretty much all the way up until, you know, only a f- you know, a few hundred thousand years ago from today. Um, group of birds that is not talked about nearly enough. I think they're very cool. So do we think that they were, like, stabbing fish with this thing? Or just kind of, like, breaking up food with this? So they basically just helped grab, you know, slippery, squishy fish. Gotcha. Or, or potentially squid. Uh, from what I read, it kind of seems like, you know, they're not very robust. Uh, so they weren't grabbing, like, sort of tougher or armored fish. So they were going after, like, squid or relatively softer fish. Um, but no, just having spikes <laughs> help you grab onto slippery stuff. That's why... Um, like crocodiles that eat more fish have spikier teeth or pointier teeth, whereas things like alligators have blunter teeth because they eat more harder things like turtles occasionally or, or whatever else they find. So that's pretty much it for birds. Birds were doing bird things pretty much fully, especially by the end of the, the uh, epic. Uh, reptiles, besides birds. Um, despite the big famous reptiles being the dinosaurs going extinct, uh, at the end of the Cretaceous, there were still lots of reptiles left, uh, particularly in freshwater or sort of swampy ecosystems. Uh, most of the modern lizard groups were around in the Cretaceous, but not the main lizards sort of in their environment. The Paleocene is when we start to see that change with things like iguanas, some skink, uh, relatives. Uh, and also lots of uh, snakes, like uh, boas and pythons, when we see them start to take over as sort of the dominant snake or lizard groups in their, you know, environments. Uh, there's also the largest snake that's ever been found from this time, called Titanoboa, which is wonderful. Excellent name. Um <laughs> So that is from the latest part of the Paleocene from Colombia and uh, a couple other parts of northern South America. And it's basically a giant anaconda. However, the largest anacondas today get about 15 feet long. Uh, I think 17 feet is the largest, like, ever confirmed. But Titanoboa was at least 40 feet long. And weighed... Somewhere in the ballpark of 2,500 pounds. No, that is Jesus. too much snake for me. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you've ever seen the movie Anaconda, um, get more or less. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, in that same environment found in those same fossil formations, we have uh, a giant freshwater turtle called Carbonemis. Uh, which is often compared to a dinner table in size. Uh, so imagine like a red-eared slider the size of a dinner table. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of a lot of weird, wacky stuff going on in uh, the South American swamps at the time. Yeah. Uh, crocodilians tended to bounce back relatively quickly. Like I said earlier, they didn't really get hit by the extinction all that hard. Um, and were very diverse as far north as North Dakota and, and Minnesota sort of area, uh, as well as some fully terrestrial crocodilians down in South America. Uh, also some very crocodile-like groups of reptiles called Charistodires that were around at this time too. We don't really have time to go into the differences, but there were lots of groups of reptiles doing very, you know, well at this time. Nice. Moving into the oceans, we have our fish, and we'll breeze through this because we are coming up on on an hour, but 
Uh, I knew this was going to be a long one when I got <laughs> to page six when I finished my notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so fish, ray-finned fish, particularly teleost fish, which if you're thinking of a fish right now, uh, you're almost certainly thinking of a teleost fish. Um, they diversify like crazy uh, during the Paleocene and continue to be the main fish group in basically every environment today, both freshwater and marine. Uh, sharks and rays, weirdly, only lose like 10% of their species across the extinction. They did great. <laughs> hmm. um, however, they don't really diversify like the bony fish do, like those teleost fish. Um, they kind of just get back up to where they were beforehand, and then they just kind of call it a day. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the type of shark that was most abundant in the Cretaceous was not the type that was most abundant afterward, but they were still around, um, including the first megatoothed shark in the genus Ototus. Uh, more on that when we get to the Miocene-Pliocene episode. Uh, spoilers, that includes Megalodon. Ooh. Not Megalodon <laughs> yet at this time, but it's uh, it's like great-grandpa or so. We're getting there. Yep. Uh, invertebrates, so... Moving away from my uh, my pride and joy, the vertebrates, but all the other vast majority of animals. Uh, insects are kind of always difficult to talk about in the past because they don't leave good fossils generally. Um, they were around and uh, seem to have recovered from the extinction pretty quickly in some places, but a little more slowly in others. Didn't find too much more detail about it. Um, other than, like today beetles did really well and we can actually see trace fossils of them doing well from their larva eating plant uh so like eating leaves we find leaves with like um beetle and and moth larvae uh chewing through them uh we kind of just don't have any ants in the paleocene even though they were around in the cretaceous but we know that the two major groups of ants must have split during the paleocene and started to diversify because once we get out of the Paleocene, they're just kind of everywhere and doing fantastic, so they probably split and were doing pretty well during the Paleocene, too. Uh, butterflies and moths, really diversified toward the end, once the climate starts to change. Uh, at the very, very end, spiders seem to diversify. Uh, jumping spiders and some of the more ground-dwelling spiders become more abundant at this time, instead of the, you know, spinning webs between branches and things. Uh, and then moving on to the marine invertebrates because there's really not a whole lot to talk about even though this is, again, a, the vast majority of life in the oceans. Um, basically, anything with a pelagic stage of its life was devastated by the extinction, which as I'm sure mm -hmm. Fia can attest to, is most marine invertebrates. Yeah. So if it has a part of its life where it's up in the water column and not on the floor, it did real bad. Um, groups like bivalves that spend most or all of their life on the seafloor generally did better. Even though a lot, all of them, or most of them, I think, do have a, a you know planktonic life stage, but because they spend most of their life on the bottom, they did better than uh, some of the more mobile uh, invertebrates. <laughs> uh, clams, in, in, you know, specifically recovered really quickly, as did decapod crustaceans. Those were things like your crabs and lobsters. Uh, coral throughout the Paleocene was really up and down. Um, all the funky climate stuff going on was not helpful to them, but uh, in the Cretaceous, they weren't doing very well to begin with because they had a lot of competition from this group of bivalves called rudists that were the main reef builders during the Cretaceous, but they got wiped out by the extinction, so corals had much less competition to deal with, so in that sense, they were doing pretty well. And that's all we have time for for the life part. There's much, much more to talk to talk about mm -hmm. uh, in the aftermath of you know this big extinction. But you'll often see one of the most, even though it is this aftermath of the extinction, that's not usually what's most talked about with the Paleocene. Most of the time, you'll see the Paleocene, Eocene, thermal maximum, like we talked about at the beginning. Yeah. At the end of this epoch, between, you know, at the transition between the Paleocene and the Eocene, there was this event. 
the PETM to its friends. We had a whole episode about it. Again, episode 32. <laughs> much more information there. We're However, friends. Yes. Uh, immediately before this event, global temperatures were around 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Immediately afterward, in the earliest Eocene, pretty similar, a little bit warmer, 79 or so degrees. During this event, this very short span of time, global average temperatures spiked to about 88 degrees, potentially as high as 94 degrees global average temperature. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Say that one more time. So, before, about 77 degrees global average. During the event, jumped minimum about 11 degrees. Absurd. Potentially, uh, 17 degrees. Again, that's and what just, is it today, just for some context? Uh, much lower, in like the mid-50s, I think. 50s, right? Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Um, and so, within the span of a few thousand years, global average temperatures jumped around 5 degrees Celsius. We're currently freaking out about our current global warming, and 5 degrees is like the most unthinkable scenario that people have modeled, where it's like, it's almost not worth modeling for 5 degrees Celsius, because that's just not realistic for the global warming we're currently freaking out about today. Okay. So, like I said, that's just the global average. We talked about it a little bit toward the beginning. In some places, the the change was much, much larger. Tropical sea surface temperatures at this time were around 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Or about 37 degrees Celsius. Which is insane for yeah, sea surface temperatures. That is basically unlivable for just about everything in the ocean. Based on various ways of measuring it, this whole event, from the rise to the drop back down to relatively normal temperatures, happened in a span of about 200,000 years. And that initial increase of somewhere between 11 and uh, 17 Fahrenheit, you know, give or take 5 to 9 degrees Celsius, um, happened in about 20,000 years, which might sound like a lot, but geologically, that is insane for that magnitude of temperature increase. That is just yeah. unheard of. Mm -hmm. So, what could cause this magnitude of temperature increase, you ask? Well, the direct answer is relatively simple, and that is an unholy input of carbon into the atmosphere. Hmm. Absolutely massive. Uh, the most well-supported hypothesis, so, so nobody really doubts that this must have happened, that this carbon influx must have happened. How exactly it happened is a bit more controversial. Um, the most well-supported hypothesis that I was able to find was that a series of volcanic eruptions throughout the late Paleocene was sort of steadily increasing global temperatures with their carbon emissions. You know, volcanoes just generally give off carbon dioxide. Um, hmm. So they just very gradually were raising temperatures. And then the oceans hit sort of a tipping point where uh, at the bottom of the ocean, and usually the coldest parts of the ocean, there are frozen bodies of methane just stored at the bottom of the ocean. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll often hear them called methane hydrates or methane cathrates or, or something to that effect. Um, but they're just like these super dense pools of methane at the bottom of the ocean. And as temperatures rise, those thaw. And methane is an extraordinarily potent greenhouse gas. And so... The most potent, if I remember correctly. Yeah. At least of, like, the relatively common ones. Right. So, uh, long story short, it's sort of thought that this gradual increase, on top of it already being quite hot, 
Because if you remember way back to the beginning, the coldest part of the ocean was already like 50 degrees. And so as global temperatures started to sort of slowly creep up, this caused eventually got to a tipping point and caused a lot of that methane to thaw and shoot up out of the oceans into the atmosphere all at once. Hmm. And there, there are different sort of things that also might have been a factor here. Some people have proposed common fluctuations in Earth's orbit that might have, you know, led this period of time to be a little warmer than general anyway, which might have lowered that tipping point. Uh, some people have sort of pointed to around this time as, you know, a lot of those funky ocean current things. If, you know, the oceans were pretty stagnant for a while, and then some current started to circulate stuff more, that could also disturb that methane and get that out into the atmosphere quicker. And that could have contributed and lowered that tipping point even more. But this is pretty much the, the main hypothesis and one of the only th realistic mechanisms that people have proposed for this happening. Huh. So, all this methane shoots into the atmosphere. Stuff gets real, real warm. What does that do to life? You ask. <laughs> and, well, you'd be surprised. Hmm. Okay. On land, the general size of mammals especially, but most things shrunk. Just animals got smaller. Which makes some amount of sense. Yeah. So, large bodies hold heat better which you don't want during a heat wave. And this adaptation to smaller size is thought to have driven some speciation in at least mammals, since many mammal groups that we have today show up for the first time basically right after this. So th this might have kick-started uh, mammalian evolution that had been, you know, doing ex experimenting and doing some funky things throughout this epoch, but been really kick-started by this event. Um... Another really important thing to talk about here that I don't think we've ever really talked about on the show before is the difference between a turnover and an actual extinction event. So, an extinction event is when extinction rates go really high and speciation rates are really low. So, lots of things are going extinct and new species are not, you know, originating to replace them. Okay. Okay. A turnover is when there's a lot of extinction, but there's also a lot of new species coming around at the same time to take their place. Okay. So this was not really an extinction, but it was a turnover. A lot of those weirdo guys that we talked about at the beginning, they kind of go extinct. They had their four to six or so million years of, of their heyday, and now they're on their way out, replaced by the more familiar groups of mammals that we still have around today. This is also the case for a lot of groups of plants as well during this time. Okay. Uh, however, as I'm sure you were thinking, Fia, uh, in the oceans, things did get quite bad. There was quite a lot of death, <laughs> but not <laughs> quite in the groups you might think. Again, corals... Okay. This, this was a very short time period, so corals were able to bounce back relatively easily afterward, but in this interval, did real bad. Where things got really, really bad, though, were benthic foraminifera. Foraminifera are these single-celled organisms that are just kind of all around, especially in marine environments. So the ones that were up in the water column, they, they didn't do well, but they didn't get absolutely slaughtered like these guys did. So in the span of just about a thousand years, they lost 40 to 50% of all their species, the benthic wow. ones. Jeez. Yeah. And so these are things that a lot of other, a lot of invertebrates eat as food. Things like starfish, sand dollars, as they just sort of move across the bottom. These are things that they're sucking up out of the dirt on the bottom of the ocean to eat as their food. Uh, generally, across the oceans, both top and bottom, especially in the tropics, microorganisms did really poorly. But 
a lot of the other things somehow did okay, which I'm very confused by, because microorganisms in the ocean are basically the plants of the ocean. That's what everything else eats. Uh, hmm. So, uh, fish seem to have done quite well, for example, across this interval. Not quite sure why. Uh, not sure what they were eating, since all, a lot of their food was gone. Um, if this had been a more prolonged event, maybe things would have turned pretty badly. But like I said, this was 200,000 years, which, you know, is is quite short. As much as, a, you know, it's a very quick onset of all these conditions, it's also a very quick drop-off of the conditions as well. Um, so, who really knows what was going on here? But this particular event is looked at very closely for our current modern climate change. Hmm. Um, because mm-hmm. this was the most recent time where a ton of carbon just got pumped into the atmosphere all at once. And this is what happened, where it's, yeah, the world didn't end, but the animals around before were definitely not the same ones that were around after. And we kind of yeah. need a lot of the animals that we have today. Yeah. Including us. We are one of the animals around today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the main difference between this event and what's going on today is that uh, the world was already warm at the time. So there wasn't a whole lot of ice to melt from this like there is today. Um, and so because of this event, there wasn't like a lot of sea level rise or, or anything like that, uh, which there absolutely will be. And we're currently seeing today. Um, if you want more of this depressing talk, go listen to episode 32 all about this event. Yay. And so, yeah, with with that, <laughs> that puts us right at the boundary between uh, the Paleocene and the Eocene. And the Eocene, as I mentioned, and spoilers for, uh, you know, sometime in the next 10 episodes or so when we talk about the Eocene, that's when we really start to see environments, and particularly the animals in them, starting to look a lot more like the ones we have today and looking much more familiar. Cool. Yeah, so that's that's pretty much all I've got for you guys today. Do you guys have any last burning questions about this uh, this kind of weird ten million year blip in uh, in Earth history? I think you've covered just about all of it. Well, thanks. All right, and this has been episode one hundred and twenty six of "I Wish You Were Dead," a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That was Gavin and Fia, and we will see you guys hopefully in two weeks, but we'll see. This episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Gavin Davidson and hosted by Gavin Davidson, Mike Bryson, and Fenella Campanino. It was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you. 